We're here to talk today about five cyber incidents with Jim Lewis, Bob Dietz, Judith Miller, Franklin Miller, and Bob Geisler. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to, to Jim. And Adrian, you should have introduced yourself. We have Adrian LaPointe who Adrian will LaPointe. be doing what we're going to do here today is we're going to bring up a set of incidents. It was hard to come up with them because every time we thought we had a final slide deck, one of our foreign friends would do something else funky, and so we'd have to re advise them, uh, revise them which drove the panelists a bit wild. But what do we want to do here today? We have some goals that are a little different from the normal discussions of cybersecurity. And I think, uh, I'm going to steal Frank's line, I think uh, Secretary Lin teed some of them up for us. Um, when we look at these incidents, the US now has a national doctrine, right? And it was in the international strategy. It was uh, previewed in the President's May 29th uh, speech. Uh, you'll see more of it when the DOD strategy finally avert, emerges in the next year or two. Um, that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> it didn't work. Um, <laughs> what is that declaratory policy? It's that cyberspace is a vital national asset and we will use all means to defend it, right? So what does that mean? And we have a very experienced and distinguished panel who can go through these incidents and tell us when does something justify a military response? When does something justify the use of force? When is Title 10 appropriate? When is Title 50 appropriate? How do we signal to malicious actors in cyberspace our discomfort or our intent to do something in response? Um, what are the measures that we could use? We say we'll use all means uh, to defend it. Well, what are those means and how would we deploy them? These are questions I don't think have been asked at least publicly before. So what we'll do is Adrian will bring up an incident. Uh, we'll give some relevant details as if she was briefing these senior officials. And then they will tell us how we think the US should respond. What are the constraints? What are the legal requirements? So I think this is going to be a lot of fun. They look a little puzzled now, but you know, <laughs> they'll snap out of it, don't worry. Adrian. Okay. No briefer was ever this concise. In January 2010, Google revealed that its network had been hacked and intellectual property had been exfiltrated. The company reported that it had traced the attack to computers at two campuses in China. Google had recently clashed with the Chinese government over censorship of the Google search engine. The State Department filed a demarche with the Chinese government but received no response. Okay, so this was um, this was a, a, a particularly uh, galling incident in some ways, and the question would be, how should the U.S. respond when you see things like this? Um, what should we do? And we'll go through a set of incidents. Some get closer to something like the use of force, Stuxnet. Some get closer to the ability to confirm attribution. Some are directed at high value military targets. Uh, we have one in here about breaking into defense contractors. Um, but in this Google episode, what should the US have done in retrospect? If you have um, some allegations, some evidence, and we might want to talk about what evidence is necessary for uh, planning a US response, but what would a good response have been uh, to Google uh, in this particular episode? I don't say anyone want to. I can talk forever. I'm from a think tank. Go ahead. Well, let me pitch in for oh, Judy. You got I got it. Go ahead, Judy. Yeah, sorry for the delay, <laughs> mechanical um, uh, irresponsibility. Anyway, uh, you know, a, a couple things. Uh, I do think going to the point of evidence, uh, if, if you were actually having a real discussion with officials about this, you'd know a lot more than what has just been very briefly said. You'd, you'd also know a lot that you didn't know. I mean, I'm not saying you would have all the answers, but you would have much more available than what has just been uh, uh, teed up for this discussion. And you'd have an opportunity to, to query a whole range of people in the government about what they, and at Google, about what they actually knew. Uh, and so there is a little bit of, um, I guess, you know, inherent lack of rigor in, in discussing this. But, uh, and, it, and it is, uh, the reason I'm uh, 
pushing that point is that I think that happens a lot in our discussions of cyber. One of our biggest problems is that we operate at a level of generality and a, la a level of abstraction that makes it really hard to have the kind of detailed discussion about what the U.S. should do in a particular spot. So one of my, my uh, themes, I guess, in talking about this is that we should be more transparent in talking about the kinds of attacks that we're up against and what we might be able to do in response without giving up um, the crown jewels of the specifics. I mean, you can talk more with more candor and effect about what we're facing than simply saying, oh, it's cyber, and then, you know, somehow thinking you can have a discussion about that. Um, second, uh, the, uh, one of the reasons that I, that I push that point a little bit is that because we never get beyond abstraction, we never actually create a policy to speak of, even though the U.S. government is now in the process of trying to do that. So you would like to have an international framework for having a discussion about this. I mean, you, you know, the law of armed conflict applies if this were a use of force. I think based on the facts that we have here probably wouldn't be particularly applicable. Um, but you uh, might very well say, you know, that if, if, if there was like, you know, China had been doing this for a long time, loads of people have been attacking uh, Google and other systems in the United States, uh, you know, there is a, uh, a a possibility that you could say, even if you can't attribute this to the Chinese government, if they can't control their own people uh, in an effective way, that there may in fact be some discussion that goes beyond a demarche about, about their responsibility and what the U.S. government properly could do to position itself uh, in, in taking steps that, that don't look totally ineffectual. I was going to say, we have to... I, I, I think the nature of cyber uh, is, is, is ambiguity. And so we ha constantly, we're moving into an era where we, ha where we have to face policy uh, choices with far more ambiguity than we ever have in the past. Uh, in, the, in the Cold War, where, uh, where the Soviet Union engaged in uh, egregious espionage against uh, U.S. Uh, uh, nation state secrets as well as with industry, we pretty much knew it ultimately was a KGB or GRU operation. Uh, and trace it back to, uh, to a Soviet policy that they were going after us to, for competitive as well as uh, national security reasons. But today, in this case, uh, university uh, servers are notoriously uh, vulnerable. It could have been a pass-through to a U.S. competitor uh, launching that, that probe uh, for, for, uh, uh, for uh, IP from the United States. It could have been somebody from the EU uh, for uh, looking for uh, IP. Uh, from, uh, from a competitor elsewhere, or it could have been a Chinese commercial competitor as well as a Chinese government <coughs> interested in that. I note with interest, though, that uh, our default after the Google hack was this is the Chinese government going after Gmail um, to try and repress Chinese dissidents. And we made some gross assumptions. We, I'm saying uh, media-driven uh, uh, dialogue made some gross discussions that, or uh, assumptions that ultimately we never could prove. Uh, it could very well have easily been a Chinese variant to Google looking for their search algorithms in, uh, in source code. So I think we have to be very careful immediately couching this as a nation state problem, uh, when in fact the larger strategic issue is the trillions of dollars of IP that's stolen every year on a commercial basis. China introduces a unique problem in that a lot of their industry is nationalized and a lot of the agencies that are doing uh, or sponsoring hacking also have commercial interests. So you, say, you start to have to pry out the intent of this uh, and start accommodating for that very ambiguous uh, uh, intent of the actor uh, as well as the actual event itself. I think that um, one of the things that a policymaker would have to confront at the very beginning of all of this is what kind of constraints do we want to apply to what we may be doing. And so in the world of Title 10 and Title 50, the policymakers need to be very careful about setting standards which would apply to everybody else except us. <laughs> because however good we are, we're not that good that we would not get caught at some point. So, I mean, that's an overarching element for this entire discussion. Uh, secondly, and I, I think that, that 
Judy was, was spot on when she talked about discussions on rules of the road. And I think there are, there are, there are two elements of rules of the road. One is, is in the world of, of, of commercial intercourse. We're going to have to evolve over time some way for people to protect commercial IP. That, and, and even that is in China's interest over time. That's something that can and has to be worked out. And, and just as in the Cold War, we were able to sit down with an implacable enemy of the Soviet Union and work out means of discussing first strategic arms and then, and then limiting them. There is a way forward here that requires government in involvement. I think the second part of the rules of the road, which really doesn't apply to this case, but which applies to other cases, is that even in the Cold War, to the point Bob made, there were pretty much rules of the road in espionage. I mean, there are things that we did and that the KGB did and that we didn't do. And when one side crossed the line, there were ways of letting the other side know. And, and again, it doesn't apply here, but I think the concept of rules of the road, both in an, in an official and public way, and also in an official and private way, is something that demands a great deal more thought as to how to bring actors together. And, and as Judy said, there is the problem of, of patriotic criminal hackers, you know, who are either in it for their own commercial benefit or it, they're, they're doing it because they think it's the right thing to do. And, and it, clearly the United States government doesn't have the ability to take care of all of the hackers and nuts running around this country. Think about the Chinese government. That's not to absolve the Chinese government for responsibility in a case like this. But it is a, a problem that, again, fits into the rules of the road and, and criminal conduct and all the rest. Could I just pile on one point, which is that um, on, the, on the rules of the road uh, for the U.S. and what's at stake, I mean, I think Deputy Secretary Lin this morning certainly made uh, a fairly clear reference to the point that, you know, the United States is more dependent at this moment on IT than anyone else. And so we ought to be clear about that. And, and you know, my own opinion is that it's more important to protect all the stuff that we are dependent on than to protect the ability to have some agile um, offensive capability that we would like to use but wouldn't want to see used against us. If I could, um, I'd like to make a, a general point that applies to all these scenarios, so I'm, I'm only going to mention this once. Um, actually, before I do, let me say that I'm expressing my own views. I'm not expressing the views of the U.S. government or any agency. Um, and I'm not, uh, I have no insider information on any of these events, so I just want to be clear about that. Um, to me, the problem, I'm not sure it starts here, but it is certainly worsened by the fact that we do not have a, a regime, a legal regime, to address these issues. What we have are various laws basically designed against, against hackers or in the case of NSA, NSA uh, <coughs> laws dealing with um, um, foreign intelligence collection. What we don't have is a legal regime dealing with, I, with, with the protection of IT. Uh, if you listen, to, if you listen to, to news broadcasts about hacker attacks, almost always it's something like, it is believed that these attacks come from country X. You know, imagine in the kinetic, kinetic world if we were attacked with a rocket and the military came back and said, well, we're not sure, but we believe the attack came from some country. People would be outraged by that. But the fact is that, that because of our legal regime, there is, there is, it is often unclear where attacks come. Um, and that's, again, because there's not a legal way of doing hacking back at least a, 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 a way that's likely to be successful. What, what information protectors would like to be able to do is you take an attack and you start tracing the jumps backward. But under current law, that's not possible. So what we end up with in this country is a, is a fortress regime, you know, fortress Pentagon, a of, of, of fortress um, military, of Fort Meade, or Fortress America. 
And, and that's good, you know, I'm not, I'm not attacking those kinds of defensive measures. But the fact is that that doesn't, I don't think is likely to be successful in the long run any more than Fortress America works in the kinetic sense. And so what I believe is true here, uh, and, and is true in all these scenarios, is we need a new legal regime specifically to address uh, tax. You know, to, and to, to people will often say, well, wait a minute, you know, isn't that likely to have, have us have people, NSA folks, for example, running back through university servers? And the answer is probably yes. But I can't believe that we could not design a legal regime where that would be possible in a way that would satisfy privacy advocates. I mean, my metaphor for this is there's a very big difference between cops breaking into a house in order to search it and firemen breaking into a house to put out a fire. You know, I think it was Holmes said, uh, um, even a dog knows the difference between being stumbled over and being kicked. And in this context, intentionality matters. To, to just clarify that a little bit, what you mean is a astute opponent would uh, complicate any U.S. response by doing maybe the last couple hops through U.S. persons. It's my understanding that that's routinely done. Um, there are people here who probably know more about this than I, but the, you know, you start with a, you make some jumps in the foreign country, then you come to this country, go through some university servers, go through you know, my server at home and so forth, and then finally conduct the attack. And that's what makes attribution so, so difficult. Oh, just one quick comment though, which is that um, uh, part of it is the it's not just Title 10 and Title 50, it's also the, you know, the divide between military uh, intel and law enforcement because absolutely clearly the computer crimes unit at Justice, it, can get, it may have to get authorities here and there, but they can do this kind of backtracking without any difficulty, and they were doing it in the 90s. So, uh, you know, it's not necessarily that we don't have a legal regime that you can't patch together and make work. It's just that we're patching it together because it's, you know, sort of trying to make uh, statutes and authorities that were designed truly in a purpose. different world, in a different purpose, and trying to make them kind of work instead of taking a step back, which can always be exciting, uh, and saying to Congress, well, you've really got to change some of this. Um, I do want to agree with one other thing, though, which is that I actually think you can do this and sustain privacy rights. If you bake it in at the, at the get-go so that you have credibility with, with everyone in this country about what we're doing, uh, uh, you will, uh, you can do that. You don't have to give it up, and you can, I think, create a consensus of some sort that would allow us to have a legislative change that would be at least a building block for the international rules. I think that's right. But I, but I think there is one element in, in what Bob was saying that, that complicates all of this, and that is law enforcement or the Title 50 agencies may be reluctant to that's reveal simple. the fact that they can trace it back. I mean, there may be times when they will be perfectly prepared to do that. And there, may, there may be other times when they're not. And that, that does complicate our ability to, to go to this kind of a regime, although I support very much the notion that if we don't move to that kind of a, uh, a world where, where there's a rule of law, it, it's going to be uh, bad for everybody. Dragging that back to your point on there were ways in the past that we could signal the other sides when we were unhappy that they had crossed some line. Does that complicate, what would that look like in cyberspace and does an unwillingness to reveal what we may know complicate that? Sure. Well, I, you know, I think the, the signaling, signaling is both uh, uh, overt and, uh, and undeclared at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're not going to handle this with a demarche. Uh, it, it's, it's like, let's like theater on the international stage, okay? We've got that out of our system, we're happy, now we can go on doing our business. Uh, but, but you also have to show that by uh, demonstrating that that behavior has some equivalence from our perspective. So, if you assume PLA is the ones that did the Google hack or PLA continually penetrates DOD networks, uh, or any nation state for that matter, then there are ways you can noisily go about penetrating that networks. Uh, and just like during the Cold War, we used to fly up and down coastlines in a very, very 
sometimes provocative uh, demonstration that says, uh, you know, I'm going to be as aggressive as you are. Um, and I may also have a tiered approach where I'm going to very quietly uh, 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 conduct intelligence operation, but at the same time, I'm going to be very noisy um, and, and put some sort of equivalence uh, uh, operationally on this so that, it, so that we can finally start uh, having some, some adult dialogue at the, uh, at the diplomatic table. Uh, but until you start showing an actor that there is equivalence or a, 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 um, um, uh, a reciprocal action uh, that, and, and at, at a pain point that finally gets them to pay attention and to adjust their behavior, that will continue. But I think that, that actually raises, I mean, we're probably going to use this one slide to bring the entire discussion <laughs> forward. Uh, one of the, the, the interesting elements in signaling, or indeed even in responding, is to understand that you don't have to do so in the same medium. Mm -hmm. um, I, that particularly applies uh, to countries who are not as reliant as we are on cyber. I mean, if, if you want to inflict pain, or if you want to inf signal that you have the capability to inflict pain, you need to find the point of pain, and it may not be in the cyber world, it may be elsewhere. And that's why I think this entire discussion is, is a really rich vein, because you have to figure out what the vulnerabilities of the other side are, and you have to be able to say, okay, to the degree that, that I'm willing to tell you, I, I know you're doing something that's a very bad thing to do, and, and other things could happen in other realms that, that would not that would not be a good thing for you. But it requires us to think through this a whole lot more carefully rather than to go into the reflexive, well, we've been attacked, so we're going to use kinetic or non-kinetic or, or cyber. One of the things I worry about with signaling, and it's not a big worry, but you know, we had had a long time to establish uh, kabuki theater with our Cold War opponents. And so you could do a tacit or implicit signal, and they knew what it was, right? And when you talk to some of the potential opponents today, other than the Russians, um, they don't have that understanding. So how would you develop this capability? I was in um, uh, China a couple weeks ago and was talking to someone from the PLA and brought the notion of equivalence forward and it was a surprise to them. They were complaining about our intelligence vessels coming into their EZ and I said, well, you know, some people use ships for intelligence purposes and some people use other stuff. And that was like, what, huh? So how do we, how do we, um, they didn't like that. Uh, how do we build, there's a formal rules of the road that you've brought up, but there's also some informal understandings or rules. How do we, how do we build Let that? Let me jump in because that's one of my, this is one of my, my hobby horses. And I think it applies to our relations with other governments, whether friendly, foreign or neutral. And I think that, that one of the lessons of the past several decades is that we cannot rely on being too subtle. There are times when we think we, you know, we've, we've really communicated a message and, and the other side hasn't got a clue. Um, and, and there are numerous, numerous instances. So whatever it is we do in terms of signaling, it has to be accompanied by a pretty clear message in private to someone in authority who understands what we've done, or we could even say, oh, by the way, you may not have noticed, but uh, we've done mm -hmm. something uh, uh, because we're not happy with what you did. Okay. So I think it's a combination of really blunt diplomacy in private and, and whatever the, mm -hmm. the signal has to be. Let me use that as a transition point to the next incident because this one is a little clearer. I'm going to assert at the beginning that we um, have some strong ideas about who is responsible. In fall of 2010, DOD revealed that classified and unclassified military networks had been penetrated by malware resident on thumb drives given to service members in Iraq in 2008. The exploit created an opportunity for the exfiltration of classified and sensitive data to foreign servers. DOD says the attack was perpetrated by a foreign government. So, in this case, I don't know, but we didn't necessarily, do you treat this as just 
okay, one for their side, and now we, we run around on the defense? Or do you, what would a response look like? It's, this clearly, I would think, does not rise to the level of being considered under international law a, an act of the use of force. Unless you knew that they left behind, unless you really knew that they left behind things that could blow up the whole system and endanger the department's <coughs> ability to respond at all. I mean, you could always get to something that's more dramatic, but, mm -hmm. but there's nothing in, in these facts that would get you even close to, to thinking about that. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of a, the leave behind is one of the thresholds we want to think I think about so. Here. I'm not even sure that'd be a threshold. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just because leave behinds can in fact have dual purposes right. um, where you can control data, you can, you can disrupt the integrity of that data, or you can just pull data off of that. But, 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 but the fact that they, in this case, is well-known malware. Um, uh, the means to uh, uh, exfil the data was well-known. Uh, if it was ever done or not is, is, uh, is not subject for the debate. But um, uh, in, uh, as we know the data as presented to us, there is no leap behind, as Judy said, that it, it, it infers the intent to do damage to that network or the, the data on that network. But I do think it makes, one of the, going back to the point that Frank was making earlier about how you don't have to be confined to the cyber realm to think about how to respond in a variety of ways. Um, one of the things that I've noticed that we tend to do is to just look at what, you know, the actual attack itself, instead of uh, whatever, you know, the cybernet attack in this, in this instance, instead of also saying, well, we have lots of other intel sources and other ways of figuring out what's going on in the world. It isn't just confined to the cyber tracing back road and what they did with it. And, and uh, so you can, in theory, hypothesize that you actually, through other sources, realize that they actually do have some intent that goes well beyond you know, what our particular facts are. And that would create a different discussion, I think. Yeah, but that's not the discussion that this sets up. My sense is that this is a, uh, we got outwitted. And you know, you're not going to start a war over something like this. And I, I have a hard time imagining, again, assuming that there are no leave behinds. It just strikes me that this is, um, um, that, that there are some morals that ought to be drawn from this for our side, um, um, but I can't imagine doing much of anything else. Well, I, 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 you know, we have to, uh, I think, continually desensitize target audiences, our audiences, and particularly policymakers, in saying, you know, this has happened for the last 2,000 years exactly. uh, in, in conflict and in peacetime, uh, and finding an intelligence capability inside of our network is honestly going to happen as, uh, as a standard uh, and, and, and something we have to accept. Uh, I, I, think, I think the military is finally grappling with the fact that our, 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 our network's going to be penetrated um, as a norm, and we're going to have to wor uh, work on how to fight through that. Uh, we got that now. I think from a policy perspective, um, as, in, as intelligence and as forensics start to roll in, uh, you have to make sure you couch that very carefully as far as intent, and more importantly, what data we don't have uh, as, as far as the actors are concerned uh, and the intentions. And, and I think that's very important. We tend to still overhype these things, not only in policy making, but also in the media, where it becomes a massive echo chamber uh, that vastly uh, outstrips what really happened on the ground. I think, I think that's right. And I, were we having this discussion, you know, they, they, they throw out most of the people in the room and then, and then you know, we have a real discussion. Um, but, but someone in the room would, would stand up and say, well, we need to talk about intelligence preparation of the battlefield, which opens up this giant door. Um, and I'm not going to open that door. But I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think we have to get used to the notion that people are going to be operating inside our networks and we need to figure out which networks are going to be air-gapped and, 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 and absolutely sacrosanct. Uh, I don't know whether, 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 whether leave-behinds are you know, necessarily something that you draw a line at or not. And I think that's... No, just one bit of information. Yeah, yeah I, just, I just don't know. But I think that is... It's the, it's the discussion of both of those aspects 
about our own intelligence preparation of the battlefields, whatever they may be, and what, what a potential enemy may do, and what we're prepared to accept and what we're not prepared to accept, that, that forms the basis for this discussion. There is a more fundamental point that DOD, I think, and, and Bob, you touched on it, is grappling with right now, which is, you know, if you can come in, if you assume that the cybernet is open effectively, which has not been the operating assumption for DOD, or that it can be easily penetrated when, when need be, even if there is no leave behind, uh, then that raises all sorts of questions about the reliability of our um, defense capability in a big way. You know, uh, if the commanders are worried that if that they're getting the, you know, that they're being spoofed, that they're, or that, or that they actually can't use, um, you know, kinetic force because of the internet connections that that it relies on, that's a big deal. So, you know, one of the going to Frank's comment, um, one of the things that I think we ought to have more on the table that's that than I think we've had so far is a real discussion about architecture. And I'm not a technical person, so when I say this, I then have to look to the people who actually know, you know, who are computer engineers and things and actually know how this system works. But I think we ought to at least start thinking about whether some of the first principles that we put forward when the internet was first started, uh, you know, and the, and the ones that we've been building on ever since, which are sort of speed, 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 as opposed to security in addition to speed and functionality. You know, I just think we need to take a step back, and this really would require an international step back, but perhaps with some U.S. leadership around it, about whether there are things that we can do not to, you know, shut down the Internet or make it horrible, but things that we can do that actually build in some of the issues that we're facing, not just the Department of Defense, but, you know, our, our companies. Uh, you know, if you look at the Sony PlayStation example, which has been in the news recently, and I think the Wall Street Journal or someone reported that they had quantified their loss to date, and you know, don't hold me to this, something like $170 million. You know, I've had discussions with CEOs before where, when I was in private practice and what have you, where it was like, you know, I can't invest in this cybersecurity thing. I don't, you know, I'm not at risk. There's no problem, you know, and how, quantify it for me. Well, the, the Sony PlayStation example, in a totally different realm than, than national security, I think's quantified it in a way that would get anyone's attention. You know, that's like a, that's, even for a very successful company, that's real money. Uh, and it goes straight to the bottom line. And, and I think that, might open a different way of discussing whether it's worth spending a little more money and research to think through a different way for this architecture to operate so that we don't have to just have the given that every system we have can be penetrated. Because that's, that's you know, fundamentally that's where we are. The defense yeah. is always going to lag offense, I personally believe, uh, if we continue with the architecture that we've got. And that, you know, that's not a winning game for us. I think there are two things. One in terms of signaling overtly and clearly, we do have to say there's certain things that are absolutely off limits. And we have to say to, to, to other countries, for example, don't mess with our warning networks. Because if you mess with our warning networks, we might do something that you would really regret. You know? and, and if you found something in a warning network, I mean, that, that should merit a very strong response that I would say actually at the, the head of government level. Um, the second thing is, is, is Judy's absolutely right with that, that, that uh, defense is always going to lag offense. But we also, I think, learn from this incident and others um, that we can, through training, get our people to be just a little bit smarter. I mean, there's a certain embassy in town here that will go unnamed that, that for Christmas a couple of years ago was handing out thumb drives with lovely pictures of a capital city in, in winter. You know, don't take the, the Christmas present. So, I mean, you know, there are things that we can tell people. It's not going to be foolproof, but we can make people a lot more intelligent about the kind of things they're doing, even on the unclassified networks. Under any set of the rules of the road we have been talking about, and I think we will need some kind of rules of the road, under any set of those rules, would some more forceful response to this be justified? Or will this end up being like any other intelligence exploit? They got one, we didn't move on. I mean, what would the rules of the road look like for this kind of thing? Because in this case, it was significant. 
it was against the military, and it was a foreign government. So is it the same as everything else? Well, there's, there's one other element of this particular case in that it actually disrupted combat operations. It mm -hmm. impacted the flow of information in an area of operations, uh, and, and by, as disclosed in the media. Um, so you run into analogies, well, what if a third party actually interrupted combat operations in Vietnam, and what would we do to that third party? Uh, and so the idea of the Chinese involvement in North Vietnam and Russian involvement, we still have rules of the road as far as what we would do to them uh, that I think uh, remain sacrosanct even in the cyber arena. And I, th I think you <coughs> will have those rules with any nation, with any evolved nation state and saying, you know, what you just did was a foul and here's why. Uh, and, and, and we don't expect that kind of behavior again. I think the problem remains that ambiguity, is you just don't know who to talk to. Um, and, and, and there's sufficient gap between the responsible officials that you can talk to and the potential actor. Uh, in this case, the, uh, attribution still remains foggy. Uh, that, that the responsible officials uh, could say, I have no idea what you're talking about. So uh, again, I think this is a new era of statecraft. We're going to have to figure out how to how to breach that uh, how to breach that gap between responsibility and the action, that, and, and and we're still battering our head against but that. But that that is why I at least suggested briefly that you could look at the response if you at least have it in a country, right? Yeah, fair enough. You know. You can look at the responsibility of the, you know, it's not, it's not a failed state, it's the opposite of that, but you nevertheless can look at the country's responsibility for enforcing rules of the road for its citizens. Yeah. So that it's, maybe one of the rules of the road is it's not enough to say, oh, it keeps happening here, it's happened a billion times, but, you know, geez, we don't know how it happened. I mean, yeah, I, Judy, I think that's right? ultimately going to be the, it's going to have to be the answer. Exactly. I, I would offer, um, uh, the implications, though, are that in the, in the Estonian denial of service case, 17% of the computers that attacked Estonia were in the United States. Um, it, so if you flip that scenario and say, did the Estonians then have the right to attack us? Uh, and conversely, what was the government of the United States' responsibility for that 17% of that, that attacking uh, uh, force? Uh, and what could we have done under the rule of law to uh, alleviate that pain from, from the Estonian government? Im implicit in what I think both Bob and Judy are saying, uh, but I think it's worth making it explicit, is that attacks are really cheap. You know, in, in the old days, you, you, don't build, you don't build missiles in your backyard. Um, but these days, a sophisticated hacker can do enor enormous harm. Um, it, the attack may look to a rational player as if it came from a government, but it could well just have come from, you know, an underemployed uh, youth. Um, and, and that makes this problem much, much more complicated. Let me ask two things on this, though, because first, <coughs> what's the drawback to going to somebody and saying, uh, stop, uh, even if it turns out it wasn't them, right? And I guess there's some embarrassment. I, I don't know that that's ever stopped us from doing things in the past. <laughs> you know, so what's the drawback that ambiguity creates? And the second thing is, how much does aggregation influence ambiguity? So you have 30% uh, certainty that it was uh, a country, it was Russia, and it's not enough the first time, and you have 30% in the second incident, and you have 30% in the third. At what point do you say, to heck with it, I'm going to go talk to these people and say, look, here's a, I discern a pattern, um, what are you going to do? So, you know, I don't, is, is ambiguity that big a threshold for cons going to someone and then at what point does other factors other than specific evidence mm -hmm. on a specific incident reduce that ambiguity? I think Ambiguity is a factor in a couple of ways. One is if you go and accuse somebody or, or debarge somebody in, in, you know, with, in, and they're the wrong person, you risk having that information get back to the real perpetrator, mm -hmm. thereby reinforcing the perpetrator's view that I'm in good shape. And, and so that's, that is that's one issue. You, 
when you go forward, you want to have a pretty good case. And, and your lawyers are going to make sure that you do, and, and rightly so. Uh, and aggregated series, I think, starts to undercut the, the, the notion of ambiguity. If, you can, if, if, if you're getting, you know, yeah, I, was, I was a policy guy. Don't, don't ask me to talk about, about, about uh, uh, compounded uh, probabilities, but, but you can get there. Um, but I think the third thing, and, and it's a point Bob Easler brought up, is, is you do need to choose your target. You do need to choose the person to whom you are speaking with great care, because you could go into the foreign ministry at a senior level, you could talk to the foreign minister and say, you're absolutely wrong, I know nothing about it. And, and that could literally be true. So if you do make these demarches, uh, they, they might have to be the head of the intelligence service or indeed to the head of state. Uh, so well, although think about the stealth aircraft and Secretary Gates' visit to China and, uh, you know, but anyway. Yeah, no, so it right. happens in that's other realms. Absolutely. I will point out that we did, when we thought very carefully about setting up this panel, we wanted it to reflect the realities of Washington. So we have uh, two policy guys, two operators, and two lawyers. So that, uh, that struck me as a realistic <laughs> representation. <laughs> <laughs> And in yet another yet another slander, Judy. Yeah, yeah, just, was, was there was, I have right never now. been in a session where lawyers were not slandered. But, uh, but it was a subtle slander. You have to admit. I mean, it was an implicit, <laughs> somewhat ambiguous. It was ambiguous and a signal. So uh, <laughs> maybe that's maybe that means we should go to the next incident, which is a little clearer, I think. And this one is different. It crosses the line. Why don't you go ahead? Sure. In September 2010, as we'll all remember, Stuxnet malware caused physical damage that wiped out roughly a fifth of Iran's nuclear centrifuges. The sophistication of the malware has led experts to suggest that it was produced and deployed by a nation state. In the U.S., 36 percent of industry direct executives from critical electricity infrastructure enterprises queried in a 2011 McAfee CSIS study had found Stuxnet on their systems. It, this one strikes me as there's one area where you could say it's not ambiguous. There was physical destruction. So it would be interesting to know if you all agreed this could qualify as something that was the cyber equivalent to the use of force. Right? There is actual damage. There's actual destruction. It's not dramatic, and there aren't thrilling TV photos of smoking ruins. But this would, for me, qualify as an act of force. Which doesn't end the discussion, because even if there is a use of force by the other side against you, for example, if you bring it home to us for a second, you still have to go through an analysis of whether or not the response is then force or something else. Right. Uh, and that affects, is affected a great deal by how much damage really occurred uh, and whether it's really necessary to use force, whether in the same realm or a different realm, to respond. So, but at least I, I think that the physical destruction, and you know, you could up the ante and say the Stuxnet, I mean, hypothetically in the United States, if it, it or the equivalent, which it attacks control machines, so that's a big deal for the electric, electrical grid. So, you know, if you had evidence that there were Stuxnets and, you know, cr across all the important nodes of our electrical grid system and, uh, you know, that would be a really kind of um, interesting problem. The first problem would be, can we get this out of here before it actually makes everything crash? Because that would be a disaster. And if, if the disaster occurred, for sure, that, that's a, a, a use of force um, against our country that we would then want to think about responding to appropriately and quickly. Uh, I'd offer in control system attacks, the most damaging attacks have uh, traditionally been from insiders who know not only the system but also the processes they intend to disrupt. So economically, insider threats to critical infrastructure are, is a big deal. Um, so if, if we were all in a room getting this intelligence briefing, I, I would try to th you know, throw it right back at the briefer and say, well, who says it wasn't an Iranian insider that caused this? Uh, prove to me that somebody else did this, uh, as opposed to an insider. Prove to me it actually happened, uh, because a lot of this is anecdotal. Uh, 
and prove to me what aspects of this attack were nation state versus economic. What, what were the Iranians being, um, uh, being brought or extorted? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take out your nuclear reprocessing capability if you don't give me $2 million, which is something we actually see a lot of uh, in, in, uh, in global commerce. So there's a lot of questions that still have to be answered. Now, a, as you start tearing apart Stuxnet, you start seeing aspects of a nation state attack. It was, it was very limited, very targeted. There obviously were lawyers involved who said, you know, make sure you limit the attack proportionally to, to what, you, uh, what your objectives were. Uh, I'm speculating now. Um, uh, so one infers that this was a mature nation state saying this, uh, this is what you, these are your limits. Uh, one infers that they actually were concerned about international law uh, when they were crafting that. Um, or, uh, because Stuxnet ultimately proliferated, uh, uh, there was either an element of desperation or somebody goofed you know, as far as trade craft is concerned. Uh, so I, th I think everybody can authoritatively say there's a nation state attack. Nobody has been able to attribute it, um, you know, again, the ambiguity of the cyber arena. But the point is, I think Stuxnet uniquely has elevated, or I should say, uh, 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 lowered the threshold for conflict in, uh, in the cyber world uh, because somebody got away with it. Somebody actually damaged a strategic asset in another country. And, and, and I think we now have to say that that inherent threshold of deterrence or inhibition for cyber operations has been lowered inextricably for the first time in history. It's an interesting concept to explore because now you have to start saying, um, who's living in the glass house uh, and are we prepared? Is, or, are the Israelis prepared or, or, or for that matter, are the, are the Chinese prepared for the next round that is going to inevitably occur because now that Stuxnet out, somebody has the architecture for some advanced payloads and for some advanced control system attacks that uh, I think we haven't heard the end of Stuxnet. Three points. I mean, the first is, is I, I don't know that you can set as a threshold the fact that something was destroyed. I mean, I, it, is, it is very serious, but then again, can one say that there's never been a, a, an intelligence operation, ours or somebody else's, in the history of the Cold War that didn't destroy something? I mean, Tom Reed's got a couple of books out where he says that, that we blew up a Soviet pipeline in the 1980s. I don't know whether it's true or it's not true, but, you know, okay, take, take that as a given. So the question is, is, is the physical destruction of something, the red line, or is it physical destruction which threatens great losses? And we, we will come to that later. So, I mean, that, that's sort of, I think, um, physical destruction, yes, no impact of that destruction. Um, and then Bob's point, which I think is really worth hitting, and, and whoever was behind Stuxnet, one hopes, thought this through, having taken this kind of an action, um, you would expect that the other side might mount some retaliatory action. What do you have to deter that? You know, Is there in the world that none of us know about a signal that said, we did this, but don't, don't even think about coming back because, and I don't know that either, but you're absolutely right. With advanced payloads, people need to think about what the, the third and the fourth and the fifth step is down the line. And I would think anybody coming in with a really bright idea to, to an NSC or a principal's committee or a deputy's committee meeting had better have um, that sort of, of chain of events thought through and at least having built a plausible case that you could get through all of that. I would just add to um, Judy's point, it seems to me the issue is not only the, the immediate destruction, but what else was put there. Um, it seems to me that, and this applies, of course, to, to our next scenario, but it's, it's one thing to, to damage something. It's another thing to put in Trojan horses or whatever, uh, logic bombs, as they're sometimes called. Um, that could cause enormous damage down the road at, 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 when certain events happen. And it seems to me you'd want to look at those very carefully as well to decide what kind of response is, is needed. And I use the, the electric grid in the United States as an example and yeah. said 100 percent takedown yeah. as a premise for saying, okay, that would be something you would want to 
think really seriously about responding to appropriately. Uh, <laughs> right? yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if you took down instead a tiny bank in, I'll, I'm not trying to pick on any state, but just some small bank someplace that really didn't have any impact on our economy at all, that would be a very different kind of analysis. And even if it, if it physically destroyed that network or that little bank, you know, you would probably not be thinking that we're starting World War III. So the scope issue is something we're just going to have to kind of grope our way towards. But scope well, but, but, of, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, but, but we do it all the time in the, in the kinetic sure. world. And that, that's one of the things. This is not, I mean, um, it's not rocket science to apply the standards that we have. And we've used, you know, routinely and, and I would argue reasonably successfully for, you know, decades in the kinetic world. It's just that we're not used to doing it in part because, going back to my sort of opening point, we're not transparent enough in talking about what, what these capabilities are. We haven't gotten, we just haven't gotten practiced enough, and I think through exercises and simulations we could get more so, to actually think through these issues so that when Frank says you're walking in, you know, if you are walking into a, a, to a principal's or a deputy's meeting, uh, to talk about some of these issues, the people around the table are not like all deers in the headlight, we don't even know what you're talking about, but instead they've been through it in the way they've been through a whole variety of other things that are endemic to national security discussions. Scope, I just wanted to add, not only sort of the breadth of the damage, but also what's lying there in the future uh, mm -hmm. causes for potential damage. Yeah, I think that the, those two points are kind of crucial ones in that we have, treated cyber warfare or cyber attack as this you know, unique thing. And the more we can push it into the realm of traditional experience, noting that there will be areas of ambiguity, mm -hmm. right? But the more we can say that the laws of armed conflict apply, the easier this will be to deal with and the easier it will be to think of responses. But I, 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 I was gonna say, I, I, I think universally all four of us have lived through that and, and, and the, the more you deal with cyber, the more you realize it is the same. Uh, the same rules of the road apply. The same rules of armed conflict apply uh, in international norms. And there's some fuzziness on the edges, but uh, I know these two in particular have uh, beat me over the head years ago on, on that topic. Only when you deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was encouraging it. So. Uh, but I think as we talk about scope, it reverts back to, to an earlier part of our discussion about rules of the road. And, and picking up on Judy's point, a small bank in some, some state may not be a big deal, but as the world is just so linked in terms of e-commerce and e-banking, it may not be impossible to develop a rule of the road among nation states that you don't touch the financial sector. I mean, unless it's World War III, you don't touch the financial sector because everybody's implicated in the end. Um, you don't touch electrical grids, and we'll come to that. But there may be areas where you can actually get people to cooperate. You know, I, I share the view of my colleagues that, that we do have um, models from the kinetic, kinetic world that, that are applicable, so it's not, this is not all new, but what does make it, I think, somewhat different that we need to understand is, again, some really bad, destructive stuff can be done by just a couple of people, okay. and, and, and that's different. And, I mean, I, I, could, I could easily imagine a scenario in which we demarched some government, and they said, well, we have no idea what the hell you're talking about, and, and mean it. Um, and so I expect a, what might be a little bit different in the future is some of this may end up being more police style uh, action as opposed to um, you know, armed conflict kind of thing. But again, Bob, uh, we have traditional models for, uh, for law enforcement. We do. Um, we know, do. And I think the, the whole debate after 9-11 is how we handle terrorism. But, uh, That's a good point. Where terrorists can do massively destructive things and there's no nation state behind them. Yeah, I think. Good point. A yeah, good way to test uh, uh, somebody's response, if you went to another government and said, what happened? And they said, we have no idea. Maybe the next question should be then, 
Okay, so cooperate with us in the investigation yeah. by the law enforcement guys. Yeah. And if they say no, uh, which at least some of our opponents right now would probably say no, you know, that's a good tip. Yeah. You know? So there's maybe the next step here is, okay, it wasn't you, I accept that, help me investigate. And that's part of the responsibility of the, of the, that, of the nation state that I was trying to suggest mm -hmm. earlier, yeah. which is, you know, you can't just say, ah, well, it's happened, but that's life. We, that's life. <laughs> There's more to it. Um, but I do think the, the um, even the, now I'll sort of switch back slightly. The, um, I do think that there are lots of, of sort of, of examples in the kinetic world that we're used to that absolutely apply here. But the fact that people don't get it right away, I think sort of requires us to have a more explicit international conversation about what those rules are and how they do work in this world, even though it shouldn't be rocket science to figure it out. What, what would that international conversation look like? This is a self-interested question. <laughs> well, I think we sent Jim Lewis someplace. <laughs> right, yes, exactly. I mean, I think it's hard because you could, I remember uh, seeing some, you know, there were, there were some efforts uh, as I recall, um, uh, pushed in part by Russia in the 90s, that had some sort of complexity behind uh, the motivations, I think, that they were, at least we perceived. Uh, and so I don't, you know, I'm not saying it's necessarily easy to do, but I think as, I think as countries over time, and I don't know how quickly a country like China will recognize that the tipping point has come where it has a lot at risk, as much at risk as it does in gain. You know, um, but you know, over time, countries are going to get more sophisticated about how if this can hit Iran, if it can hit the U.S. Cypernet, if it can hit uh, Sony PlayStation, if it can hit all these things, maybe there really is something there that we ought to be talking about. Uh, and you know, we sort of do know how we have treaties for lots of stuff. We could start having a process that would lead, whether to a treaty or just rules of the road. But but you know, there are various convening mechanisms that we've used in the past, and I think we should settle on one or two and go for it. Uh, someone from the PLA said to me a little while ago that in cyberspace, America has a big rock in its hand, but it also has a big plate glass window, right? And they realize now, he said, China now realizes that we have a rock, but we've also got plate glass yeah. windows. And he was sort of making the, the you know, mutual vulnerabilities mm -hmm. argument, mm -hmm. which I thought was neat. And but what's interesting is there's asymmetries in that plate, right. plate glass window. And if you talk to PLA, their concern on the internet is internet freedom mm -hmm. and the ability to, to uh, control uh, voices uh, and, and, uh, and, and potential internal uh, unrest. Go to the Middle East the same way. If you come here, you're going to have a conversation about catastrophic process control system attacks uh, you know, the, the, the electric power grid or the air traffic control system. So I think any time you go internationally, you have to be prepared to talk that asymmetry and say, okay, if you let up on taking my IP, uh, I, may, I may consider uh, less uh, relooking our internet freedom policies. Um, and, uh, because, you, because if you go to the EU, that, same, that conversation is going to be so infused with privacy issues uh, there's going to be a completely different conversation. So you have to be prepared, I think, almost in a bilateral as opposed to multilateral conversation to deal with those kind of I internet asymmetry. But I think you've just opened up a door that, that we all should have opened up a while ago, and that is there is a linkage between what happens in this world and the other kinds of policies that we pursue. And so without passing judgment on the, the administration's internet freedom policy, I mean, clearly some governments view that as an extremely unfriendly act. Um, there's always been, well, not always, certainly since the Carter administration and, and before, there has always been a debate within an administration as to the degree to which human rights becomes primus into Paris of our national security goals. Um, and, and the world is connected. And, and I think that, again, is something that would have to enter into into all of us, and there may be areas where we say we're going to throttle back a bit on that policy because we understand that we are causing you mm. internal political problems which are serious uh, and which lead to possible loss of political control. So I, that is, and, 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 and it becomes more complicated because that is a very, 
divisive issue here at home, but it cannot be hived off of this broader international discussion and perhaps even rules of the road. Before we go marching off to some international conferences, it strikes me that it'd be useful to focus on some U.S. policy as well. Um, That's the first step. We've got, you know, you can, you can hook up any old piece of equipment to the Internet, you know. Uh, I, I find it astonishing, and I'm, uh, let me say that I'm either burdened or blessed with an ignorance of the technology involved. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, when, when, you, when you, you take the cheapest piece of electrical equipment, there's a nice tag on it, the UL. And it basically, I, as I understand it, is certifying that when you plug it in, it's in the, the, the device isn't going to blow up. So far as I can tell, there's very little, um, and there's nothing equivalent to that in the computer world. And so all kinds of devices can be hooked up to the internet um, that, that, that are extraordinarily vulnerable. And it seems to me that, that you know, un, under, the, under, under the Interstate Commerce Clause of the Constitution, Congress could easily say, look, there are so many vulnerabilities here, we're going to tighten up the laws on, on what's allowed on the internet, what devices and so on. Now, I know that the internet's the, the vaunted freedom and so forth, but, you know, even, even Dodge City eventually realized that, that some laws were useful. And I think we've gotten to that point in the internet world. One of my rules is never to talk about liability, so I'll just uh, skip that one. Let me, I will come back to it, but let me go to the, the internet freedom one. I've had both Russian officials and Chinese officials tell me information is a weapon and the U.S. uses it against us. And the classic line for me was a Chinese official who told me that Twitter was an American plot to undermine governments. Right? <laughs> so, and, but this yeah, but that's a legitimate, uh, legitimate yeah. observation and you have to factor that in, obviously. Yeah. When and th they also don't assume that we, we don't have a greater degree of control over our media than we actually right. do. I and mean, right. they control theirs. No grown-up country would just let a newspaper. They don't believe it, right? <laughs> So what do, you, what do you do in a situation like that? And one of the things that has come up as an idea, and don't scream, is to hearken back to the um, Helsinki Accords, where you got a certain degree of freedom in exchange for something, recognition of borders that the other guys wanted. Is a Helsinki-like model at all reasonable for this sort of approach? <laughs> what would it look like? I mean, what would we, we don't know. I, I, I think we have to acknowledge that the internet is becoming increasingly nationalized. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Syria cuts, cut, cuts the, the entire country off from the internet. Iran tried to do that. Iraq certainly tried to nationalize the internet for, for, uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for keeping the population at, at bay. We certainly saw the infrastructure when we rolled into Baghdad for that. Um, and, and I think we're going to have to recognize that the internet as we know it is changing rapidly and that be, and it's becoming an instrument of state power uh, just like every other capital asset that we faced in the, in, in, in the history of mankind. Um, and, and I think that's going to drive such a, a multiplicity of policy uh, uh, complexities that we're just going to have to, you know, we're going to have to start dealing with far more nuances than we traditionally have in internet policy. I'm, and I'm not sure we're there yet. Right. To an authoritarian state, freedom of information is a threat. <laughs> to us, it's the lifeblood of our yeah. political process. Um, and to the degree that we insist that we're going to, it's like Radio Free Europe. You know? the Soviets jammed it, we kept, we kept broadcasting. Uh, but this is more serious because it can reach hundreds of millions of people. Um, and it's the kind of discussion, again, I'm not prepared to, to, to off the top of my head, come up with an, uh, an approach, but I think the idea that you came up with, which is a Helsinki conference that talks about various national security requirements, is not a bad place to start. Um, we're, to keep on schedule, more or less, why don't we go to the next slide? And that takes us a little bit away of where we are at the end of this conversation. It gets us back to the middle of the last conversation. Certainly the, uh, the phrase free flow of information means radically different things to anybody, to the different countries that use it. Um, as of spring 2011, U.S. electrical company networks have been probed thousands of times every week 
46% of executives surveyed said that their company's networks had been infiltrated at least monthly, and 74% of them believed that there will be a major cyber incident within the next two years. Senior intelligence officials say that some of these intrusions represent reconnaissance by potential opponents. So let me uh, uh, get on my soapbox here. Um, uh, you know, I, briefer, show me the data. Uh, show me the intent that it's reconnaissance, as opposed to um, a, I, I love picking on the Chinese, as opposed to a Chinese company who is interested at a, uh, how a U.S. electric power utility uh, um, accommodates for weather fluctuations in its load balancing operations. Uh, you know, we see, constantly see the collection of data between nation states for, for commerce purposes, and yet somehow we automatically tag everything in the cyber arena as a national security threat. And I think we have to resist that constantly and constantly batter people like you, Ms. Briefer, you so uh, to say what assumptions have gone into this, show me the data, and if we have none, don't make that leap uh, because bad things happen when we make leaps in the national security arena. And in fact, in the cyber arena, I would suggest the data s uh, says this is not a national security problem. Google, this is your problem. You got in bed in, in, from an industrial perspective uh, in China, and you knew that was a hostile environment. You knew that was an ungoverned terrain, and you should have been better prepared. Electric power utilities, you have IP you need to protect. You have operational methodologies uh, that even your competitors would like to have, and they can go fishing on the internet. So shame on you, but let me help you fix that. But if for us, from a policy perspective, that constantly see um, ill intent at the nation state level, then I don't think that's good for not only the public private dialogue uh, as public policy, uh, it certainly isn't good for international relations. If we go jumping into these things with those assumptions, uh, a priori. I agree with um, Bob, which makes me that is sort scary. of question my, <laughs> myself. Uh, <laughs> Um, Bob and I are old colleagues. I hope nobody takes that seriously. Um, I agree with him. It, it, I suspect it's very tempting for executives of any private company to want to shift costs to a governmental agency. Um, we're being attacked. Implicit in that is you, the military, or you, the police force, you've got to stop those attacks on me. Um, I don't think that's necessarily an accurate assumption. And it seems to me that, that Bob is right in the sense of, look, if your system is so vulnerable that you're being attacked, what is it, one, I mean, the statistics monthly. were, yeah, monthly, um, maybe you ought to tighten up your, um, your, your, your system and, 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 and limit that. But, you know, it's interesting because um, FERC has some regulatory authority yeah. over the right. grid, yeah. specifically on this, but it's very soft. It's yeah. just that they get to review the standards right put forward by, you know, the kind of industry yeah. uh, group that comes exactly. up with them. So, the re so, so nothing's really happened. I mean, this is a discussion we had in the 90s. We're having it right now. Nothing really has changed. Um, although the, the, perhaps the, the ability that of uh, attackers, whether they're nation states or just kids, has, you know, grown apace. So, it, um, you know, there's legislation pending on the Hill, and there's also part of the President's own initiative to do cyber, the different approaches. You know, my own bias is that on the electric grid, putting aside whether we have definitive evidence that somebody's doing something really malicious right now, it's clearly a vulnerability, and we've got to find a way to address it. And I think you have to mandate some standards from Congress. That's my personal opinion. That may not be what everyone else thinks. And then you probably have to find a way to finance it because the utility companies are still in this mode, for better or worse. You know, they're rate based. They, you know, they don't really want to do anything unless they can pass. Exactly. You know, it's perfectly rational from their perspective. They've got to pass the costs on, and if you don't have a, a basis for doing that, then they're not going to spend the money. So you've got to have an integrated approach. And I actually think we ought to pick off the, the grid as a specific example and get it done even as we're working these other I issues. agree. I agree with Judy. Absolutely. I, and and I, I take it two directions. One, um, based on some experience I had a couple of years ago um, consulting with 
with one of the larger uh, cyber defense companies in town, the, the electrical companies are just not interested. They're not, they're not going to spend the money to protect the grid, and I think they should be made to do so. Um, and there may be some federal assistance, but I think that it has to be done. But I think also um, this is the kind of message that needs to be put out by the United States government publicly that that interference with the grid um, constitutes an extremely serious act with which could lead to potential loss of life in the United States and and which would be subject to very serious retaliation whatever that may be um, you know we hear we hear suffer outages after a thunderstorm and, and, and things are bad. Um, I was recently in, in, in Tuscaloosa um, and after the tornado they lost power for about eight days. They lost power, they lost water. You know, I mean, you can cascade this. If you lose the ability to generate or distribute power to an entire region of this country, <coughs> We are going to be in very serious trouble as a nation. There will be loss of life. There will be huge economic impact. Um, and it is not impossible to take over portions of the, the SCADA networks and, and destroy generating capacity, which we don't have the, the capability to, to manufacture in this country anymore. There's a, there's a lag time of, what, two years? Um, so these are serious actions, and I think these are the kinds of things where you're absolutely right. We need to push industry with legislation if necessary, but we also need to put down very clear markers. And to me, the, the, the two key areas that right off the bat are the financial sector and the electrical uh, distribution network. Well, beyond electrical distribution, pipelines, um, okay. you know, I mean, the, Fair. the whole skate of uh, yep. industry out there. Absolutely. I, I, I think there's an interesting argument to had about the uh, efficacy of a compliance regime in cyber. And witness uh, what I would call the debacle of FISMA um, uh, that, that you know, over the period of four or five years cost three billion dollars. And one can argue that the, the, the dot .gov domain was no more secure at the end of that three billion dollars. <laughs> So I, I think it's a hybrid where you got to have compliance, a, a regulatory regime, as well as an assistance regime but from the US, you know, a true partnership between the U.S. government and, and critical infrastructure that isn't where the government comes in and beats some poor uh, 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 utility over the head, but it actually comes in and helps. And I, I think there's some encouraging trends from, from both uh, the national security side and DHS at, 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 at moving away from that compl uh, purely compliance into an assistance uh, uh, regime. And I think, that's, I think that's the actual key for, for, uh, for critical infrastructure providers. Uh, but I, I, I will tell you they are operating on razor thin margins as, as, as Judy alluded to. And, and if you roll in and say you've got to harden all your networks to, uh, to uh, up to nation state standards, uh, they're just gonna roll over and die. Uh, so, so you gotta come up with a better solution than that. But that's what I thought what Frank said was kind of interesting because it links us back to the, the Stuxnet thing, which is the, there are domestic measures you need to take, you know, Bob has brought up some, but there's also international me measures and you need them both. You need to have some way to tell other countries this is a particularly sensitive area. And it's, you can't do one by itself. We haven't ever done this before. One by itself is inadequate. A lot of our cybersecurity focus has been on the domestic side, albeit somewhat fecklessly right. for the last 15 <laughs> years. And we've never actually done the, the sort of declaratory approach that I think yeah. you and, would. And somebody, somebody will immediately jump up and say, well, now you're drawing Atchison's red line and saying everything on the other side of the line is, right. is, is up for grabs. And I, I, I understand that that point, but that doesn't justify inaction and, and signaling. This, is, this would also seem to be a, a sort of activity, if it was a government and if they were doing reconnaissance, it is something that we would normally tolerate, right? It's a little bit different because they are intruding into U.S. <laughs> space in a way that other reconnaissance activities didn't, but 
if we push satellites. Well, you, you, you know, no, yeah. that's the. I mean, they're they're yeah. photographing down. It's true. I don't know that Human I'd agree with that. Human spies on the ground. Yeah. I don't know that I'd agree with that. Really? I mean, it's, it's one thing to I don't know, associate you with my work. It's it's uh -oh. it's one thing to do military targeting. I mean, and 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 God knows we used to have lots of discussions about what targets were were legitimate and what targets are not legitimate, and that's in the kinetic world. Uh, if we, well, I don't know. I see that you've had Gulf War One. Um, <laughs> no, I was going to. Yeah, I, I, I stopped. I stopped. I was waiting where this was going. Right, I, me I, too. I'm not like sure where it's going, but I, I do. I, I'm not. It seems to me that this demonstrates hostile intent, and to the degree that we can hmm. identify the source, let me be clear. Bob's right. Briefer needs to make very clear that there are leave behinds that that in fact could be activated to to disable or destroy the network. But if one found those kinds of things, then I would take that extremely seriously. I expect the government to take that extremely seriously. We were at war with Iraq. We took out the electrical generation uh, or distribution system, and in some cases, the generation system in, in, in 91. Um, I was not privy to those discussions at the time. Um, but as a, if, if I were a government official, then I would take this extremely seriously. Well, and the, just to sort of, when you talk about, and certainly uh, uh, like electricity generation is part of the command and control, control structure sure. of most uh, uh, hostile forces if, we, if we're actually in a war. And so you then have, you can then in fact have a discussion about whether that is appropriate target, what does that do in terms of collateral damage? Is that acceptable? Mm -hmm. Duration is really a big deal. Are you just there's a whole set of issues that you can go through in the kinetic world. You have to do the same, I think, in this world. But if if the if your conclusion and your briefer is strong enough, and your conclusion is that that this preparatory activity could take down the entire electrical grid of the country for six months, as opposed to 20 seconds. That would be a big deal, you know. So it just, it really, it, I mean, the facts actually matter here as everywhere else. Suppose there are no leave behinds, though. Suppose it's just planning to do a leave behind. What do you, in the kinetic world, you know, you've lowered the temperature and you just sort of, we've so talked about we're going to have to get used to living in a world where networks, albeit changes along the lines of what Bob and Judy have said networks are n indefensible. So do we just grin and bear it, or do we, what do we? I think you do two things. One, you heighten your defenses. And again, back to that discussion as to how you pay for it. Mm -hmm. But there is also a, um, a word that's crept into the lexicon, both here, and I know Mark Grossman, in one of his State Department studies, uh, when he was on the outside, uh, and did a study for State Department on cyber, and my friend Sir David Omond in the UK, uh, is, is using, and that's resilience. And we need to look at ways to be able to suffer some damage and still to be able to recover. And that is, again, it's a government policy in cooperation with industry. So one prepares for, for worst case situations and, and decides what triage is, is necessary and makes certain that one has the capacity to do that triage. But that's why I've also met, talked about architecture and going yeah, back to yeah. first principles. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, the internet grew in this marvelous way, helped along by DARPA originally, mm -hmm. and with, um, uh, and optimized around uh, principles that, that made sense at the time, but they could be rebalanced, I would argue. And that might make it possible to have, you know, less um, abject inability to actually defend the network. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know whether that's possible, you know, with, I mean, I don't think it's an easy task exactly, but, you know, some of my tech friends say, actually, you know, it's just that no one's ever, it, it, it hasn't, you, no one will pay for it, uh, and right. it hasn't been a priority as a result. But, 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 again, looking at some of the real damage that's been inflicted <laughs> just on regular people like Sony and Lockheed and a variety of other people, you know, this might be a moment where you could actually get some smart people to reconnect on whether there are some things that make sense. That, that doesn't mean the end of the internet as we know it, just some things we could do to actually make it easier to, to build security in along with privacy yeah. and freedom. Some people have actually suggested a parallel 
internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, one where you would pay a monthly fee for security and you know that kind of thing. Whether there's a business model for that, I have no idea. But it's certainly true that, that the internet as initially, DARPAnet was never designed for the, these levels of subscribers and volumes and so on. I think there's dot .mil, there's dot, there's dot .gov, and I think there's dot .critical infrastructure. Yeah. And I think those things need to be protected now. Uh, you know, the Cold War analogy is the U.S. paid to harden some aspects of critical infrastructure uh, during the 50s and the 60s uh, and sustain that, uh, run by private industry, but, but it was federally funded. I think the same can be said for critical infrastructure now from a cyber perspective. And the resilience issue is interesting, and I think the deputy talked about it this morning uh, when he suggested that there's uh, you know, an aspect of deterrence that comes from resilience and complexity, uh, as opposed to a big strategic target that it is extremely brittle, that will guarantee to track uh, hackers like flies. You know, let me see how big a bang I can achieve. Um, and yet, if we build resilient infrastructure that, that is hard, um, that is continually updated dynamically against new threats, um, all of a sudden you'll find them going after softer targets. It's like putting a, a, a thing on your steering wheel so that somebody steals a car next to you. Well, the same, thing, same phenomena happens in, in the cyber world. Uh, you know, you still get through it, but you know, you just want them to go after Frank's car. Yeah. Although thing. there's a counter to that a little bit, which is that what you really do, if you do all that stuff and you don't fundamentally change how it operates, is that you make it harder for the kids and the people who are not super sophisticated. But you still, it, it, um, it, but you sort of weed out some of the real mm -hmm. jerks. But the, if, if you have kind of strong people out there, whether nation states or organized crime or whatever, who really spend some money on it, you still will be vulnerable. But it does at least narrow the playing field in terms yeah. of what you're supposed to be looking at. What, one of my assumptions is that that is the path we're on. That You compare who had capabilities 12 years ago when it was you know three kids in Mendocino who could hack DOD. And we'll, we're eventually going to squeeze out that lower end. It will be left with nations, advanced criminals, maybe a few others, maybe some terrorists. And so I think we're moving towards the high end. And that's where some of these issues might come up. Is we, we'll be in an environment where our, we'll be have fewer opponents and they'll have fewer opportunities, but we'll have a harder time stopping them. But that's when the whole government approach in, in, in law enforcement in particular has to get involved. Uh, you know, and I, I, I think from a, the original CNCI simply talked about technology. Right. Uh, and, and I think that's where later, later strategies coming out of the U.S. government, I think, are more important because it, uh, you know, against the nation state threat, no amount of network hardening is going to, hardening is going to stop a, a dedicated attack forever. Uh, so you've got to have the diplomacy. You've got to have international legal regimes that, uh, that, that, that provide you that holistic solution. Set. And you've got to have a deterrent. You know, you've got to figure out what makes the other side hurt. And you have to make clear that if certain things happen, life won't be much fun at home. Let's, let's use that as a transition point here to the, the final incident, where I'm going to be a little more gun ho I think Adrian is too. We've uh, changed the name to protect the innocent, as they used to say on Dragnet. Uh, you can probably figure out who this was. Yes, it's not too subtle. Uh, I speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the best so this do. month, phishing tex techniques were used to compromise authentication technology used by DOD and major defense contractors. The authentication data was put to use in an attempt to penetrate defense contractor networks and exfiltrate data on advanced weapon rate. Based on forensic evidence, the companies involved suspect proxies acting on behalf of what Jim characterized as a foreign intelligence service in Asia. Okay, so this one, you're all smiling. I don't know if that's it was good subtle. or bad. Yeah. This one's interesting for a couple reasons. First, it was a two-step, kind of like Stuxnet, right? Somebody did, we are making some assumptions here, and you could push back on that, but somebody did something uh, that was a preparatory action that was then used later in what would appear to be a more classic espionage activity. So what's, what's the response here? And some of the, the variables might be, how often have we seen this, right? Um, is it the same actor? How confident do you feel? 
Um, if you don't know what was actually lost, does that inhibit your ability to respond? You know, if the outflow was encrypted and you don't have a good sense, what, what do you do in a case like this? And this is the kind of thing I think we're going to see consistently in the future. Very sophisticated setup to an attack. You're all going to take the fifth. You can't well, do that. Well, again, to beat up on the briefer, what you, what you haven't told me is was anything lost. You know, we're describing an act of espionage, whether it's industrial or, or nation state. But you haven't told me whether uh, it, there was any damage. Um, you have described a methodology that is a little bit more sophisticated in that instead of one key um, that I had to, in order to break into the dungeon, I had to go steal one key. I had to steal two in this case in order to get both keys in the same lock. Uh, but it's fundamentally the same act. The, 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 the techniques and tactics leading up to that were a little bit more complex. That's good news from a defensive side. Uh, um, you force the attacker to actually uh, uh, do a lot more work, um, can, but unfortunately they did that work very well and, and, and did an attack. So we haven't seen the rest of that story. Um, but, it, but again, I, I, I'd, I'd recommend, and the media went absolutely crazy on this, again, when they didn't have any of the data that says, okay, they did an attack, they did it nicely from a technology perspective, but did, was there ultimately uh, no story in it, nothing was lost. And I think w we, from a policy perspective, need to hear the rest of that story before we start building all the uh, uh, options that we would present to the White House. But Will, can we expect that from industry necessarily? I'm sorry? Can we necessarily expect industry to want to give us that information? Um, you know, I think uh, uh, in this case, you know, with the defense industrial base, there is a great dialogue. Um, uh, you, you don't bite the hand that feeds you, yep. so that's a lot of leverage. Uh, exactly, uh, but uh, uh, it, it, I know of cases where that hasn't happened in the past. You know, particularly, the farther away you get from uh, government contractors in a purely private, private sector. My recommendation to my former government colleagues in responding to those kind of events is don't roll in and say, give me everything that just happened to you. Roll in and say, let me tell you how I can help you. And then all of a sudden you'll find that, that, that dialogue opening up significantly. Let me, let me damage my, 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 my reputation uh, a <laughs> bit. Um, it's interesting that with the explosion, huge growth, uh, public posture of the internet that espionage activities like this get a lot of press play. You know, in the past, if you could burrow in and find something or get something, uh, people got intelligence medals and, and nobody was the wiser. Well, okay, so now it's shifted into this realm. Um, this honestly doesn't excite me very much because it implies, and I have no knowledge, it implies that we're not doing the same thing to other countries. If that were the case, I would think that that percentage of my tax dollar that goes to the IC is being badly spent. Um, so, so this is going to happen. Uh, shame on us or on our companies that allow really sensitive data to be classified as FOUO or unclassified and stored in places where people can get at it. But I mean, this is what intelligence organizations do. And okay, so now it's in, on the internet. This, is, this, is, this has been going on since time immemorial. I, this doesn't bother me that much. It can bother you only in the sense, I think, of the authentication technology that people thought sure. was a strong protector. Sure. So it kind of, again, lands, and maybe one of the reasons the media has been excited about this is to the extent some of our most sophisticated companies thinking, and the department, thinking yep. that they can rely on this particular kind of technology as, a, as a, another firewall, not officially a firewall, yeah. but you know, a real protective device, and that behind it you don't have to yeah. I mean, you still have to have, you know, cyber hygiene, all that stuff, but, but it's really something that you can kind of rely on, and this shows that you can't. And so what it really does is deliver the message again, which we've been saying throughout this discussion, that there isn't any, you know, sure way of protecting stuff right now. 
Uh, and um, you know, that's something I think we really ought to grapple with because while it's, you're absolutely right, Frank, that it's always gone on, you know, it's still in our competitive interest economically, well, well, among I, other I, things, not to have everything flow in one direction. Just because right? this can happen doesn't mean that we should allow it to happen in terms of allowing data be, to be unprotected. Um, but as far as carrying it into the state-to-state -state realm, that, that, that's a different story. Again, a shame on us for having data. I mean, what was the story a couple of years ago that that there was enough in all the data that was stolen was unclassified, but when aggregated, was became classified. Well, you know, we're 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 the people doing industrial security at the various companies. That shouldn't happen. That's our fault. I have to admit, I admire the guys who figured this one out because they identified a a crucial target that right. could give them multiple points right. of entry. So I hope they do get a medal. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're at the end of our time, and I'm going to do two things. I'm going to quickly say what I got out of this. I thought it was a great panel, and you, you guys did better than I expected. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah. That's not slow expectations. Uh, yeah, boy, I'm say, <laughs> damnation of fake press. Right. Tremendously <laughs> high expectations, and they, of course, exceeded it. <laughs> I'm going to say quickly the couple points I got out of this, and I'm going to ask you if you have any final quick words here. I thought. The emphasis on ambiguity and uncertainty was interesting, and the notion that we're, we're in a, uh, a permeable environment that may not be fixable absent some very large strategic level changes. Um, the application, the ability to extend the rules and how we think about policy making and law that we use for kinetic incidents, and the ability to extend that into cyber is a, a useful path, and one that's probably the best thing. The whole of government approach, right? as a, a way to think about this problem, it, particularly the rules of the road internationally, ways to signal potential opponents, build common understandings. I thought that was great. And finally, the whole discussion of critical infrastructure dragged in something that doesn't get dragged in very much, which is, you know, for these guys, it's a business. And they have to remember the magic letters ROI. And how do we, how do we get into their thinking about investment and the example of hardening the telecom structure during the Cold War is a classic where we basically paid, we the government basically paid for that. So um, got a lot of good stuff out of this. Uh, any final words from our uh, distinguished colleagues? Yeah, I, if I could just make a comment about the economics of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with the introduction of the internet, there were tremendous savings available to companies. And I think companies kind of thought that these, these were free goods. And I think that the, 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 the point that a number of us have made is they're not free goods. There's a tremendous potential cost. And the question, of course, is, is who's going to bear that cost? And that, look, I mean, that's the foundation of our tort system is who, who pays for injury. Um, and, and, but I think a serious conversation needs to be, be had on that basis of, is this a government responsibility, you know, protect me, or do I have some obligation to put good locks on my door? Uh, I, I think the other thing that this discussion demonstrates is that we're really in the infancy of the, of the policy and, 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 you know, strategic and architectural. We, it's odd that we haven't been able to, to advance this discussion more in the last 20 years, despite your working on it all the time, Jim, and being amazing. Um, and and uh, so I'd just like to... Compliments. <laughs> So I'd like to see uh, a little bit more urgency around, around this problem because there's just too many examples of whether it's Sony or the electric grid or whatever, um, that, you know, that there's a real problem to work on. And if we actually thought about it, we might be able to fix it. I agree with that. I, the, the only thing I would add to your list is, is um, pushing the government to identify what are truly red lines, thinking through the kinds of threats that it would like to make, which would not be mirror image threats, to make clear that there are things we will not tolerate in this, in this realm. And, and the other question, I think, that did come out and, and, and bears some, some thinking and some discussion is, is how do we balance, as Bob started us off on the question, how do we balance some of our policies about internet freedom, which other states view as, as hostile acts with our own concerns about our own vulnerabilities uh, to what they do to us.
I, I think one of the more fascinating areas of uh, understanding cybersecurity and network intrusions is the psychology of it. And people forget this is not just technology, there's people involved. And there's, the, there's a gap between operator and policymaker uh, and legislator. Uh, there's a gap between uh, uh, how government, how, how, how cultures perceive operations and activities on the internet uh, that they have to accommodate for. And then there's a gap between technology developer and the operator that actu actually has to use that. In the psychology of understanding why do you keep on clicking that URL in an email uh, that comes from some prince in Nigeria. Uh, it, it, you know, and there's some interesting academic work being involved there, but clearly not enough. And I think the biggest problems I've seen in my career have been in, it has, has been the people wear uh, in the psychology of trying to convey a very technical problem uh, and a very emotive problem because of the sense of violation uh, that people get when their, their computer's been attacked. Uh, to, to a more rational uh, uh, understanding of what is a real problem, what is a threat, and what do we have to do about it. So. Great. Uh, please join me in thanking our panel.